Today we're going to look at London forces in alkanes and how that affects the boiling point of um, different um, alkanes and also the effect of isomerism um, on the boiling point. So we're going to start with a very simple model of how things boil. Um, we're going to use methane as our example. Now in primary school you might have um, used just spheres to represent everything which was a solid in a kind of grid. And we're going to kind of stick with that model, but there's a few things um, about it that I just want to um, clarify for you. Here I'm going to use methane and I'm going to use a set of temperatures and I'm going to start off down here um, below 90 Kelvin um, which is quite cold. Um, we have solid meth methane at that point and it's solid methane we have the particles of methane um, I've represented them as circles um, but I've very importantly I've put CH4 in the middle now what happens when we raise the temperature is we get to the point where we are almost at its melting point which is around about 90k um, and what's happening as we're heating it up is that we are getting vibrations in each of these molecules and then at 90 Kelvin what we're doing is we are um, melting the structure and uh, we are allowing these to start free movement okay um, now it's this model is one which you're probably familiar with which is why I've started with it um, but what I'd like to really highlight here is that each of these spheres re still represents a CH4 we haven't in melting it actually broken any bonds at all all the carbon and hydrogen bonds that were there to start with are still there same when we evaporate it take it above its um, or boil it, take it above its boiling point, um, we're going to then start to see molecules of methane starting to spread out and zoom off in all sorts of directions as the free movement uh, gets more and more energetic. And we'll end up with our substance boiling away as it does so. So this model shows, uh, well, the kind of like location of each molecule um, but what it doesn't show is why it actually sticks together and why it sticks together in the first place why we have the solid um, all together why we have the liquid still together and why the gas is separated well that's to do with something called London forces and London forces are a type of a force that you might hear of called van der Waals forces um, which are is a collect collective term for forces between um, molecules I'm going to represent two molecules um, of methane and how they behave together. Um, now, I'd like you to take the spheres that you had in your mind from the original example, and I'd like to um, imagine that actually um, we have the molecule, and the atoms in the molecule, as you know, have um, electrons in shells around the nucleus. Okay. Um, around the molecule then we have kind of like the area with the bonds in it and we have the area which contains the nuclei of different ones and they're all they're all kind of together um, and then around the outside we have some uh, s still some electrons around the outside of each of the atoms in the compound and I've represented this with a dot and some E minus around it okay it's not a perfect model um, but I want to explain why these two would actually be attracted to each other in the first place. And what's going on here is um, that actually it's wrong to think of these electrons as being stationary. They are actually in constant movement. Now I'm just going to turn this one um, around to demonstrate it. But actually they're not, they're not orbiting kind of like that either. Um, they're not. They're kind of doing that, and they're also vibrating, and uh, there is some whizzing in opposite directions across the molecule. But just for this model, I've draw, drawn them kind of as a cloud which moves together, which isn't quite true, but it gives it gives us uh, a model which will help us explain what's going on here. So these uh, these molecules and their clouds of the clouds of electrons, which are kind of like part of the molecule, um, when they are near each other they um, sh demonstrate some kind of force of attraction and the attraction comes from the, this random movement of electrons. So I'm going to start with this black um, molecule here. Um, let's imagine that this black molecule, all of the electrons move in the same direction at the same time. It's possible but it's not um, 
entirely likely. Um, but let's imagine that happens. We have a large amount of negative charge here, and we have a positive um, charge where the uh, protons and the nucleus would be. Um, and so we end up with what we call an instantaneous dipole. Okay, now a dipole is basically an imbalance of charge, and so here we would have a very, very weak positive charge because of the um, lack of electrons, and over here, because of the um, large amount of electrons, if you like, um, we would have a very slight negative charge. Now, this isn't a full negative charge. It's not like there's a whole electron's worth of charge over here, because these are still kind of pretty much in the same place. It's just there's slightly more negative over here and slightly more positive here. And we would call that an instantaneous dipole because it's formed basically by the random movement of electrons. And these form all the time. Okay, not quite, uh, not quite as dramatically as that, uh, but um, it, it, wherever I move this cloud of electrons, um, I will have um, an imbalance in the charge. I will have a dipole which forms randomly, unless they're all perfectly symmetrical. So we call that an instantaneous dipole. So if this molecule forms an forms instantaneous dipoles around its atoms, then um, that will actually affect the molecule next to it, because if I have a slight positive charge here, all of the electrons here will be very slightly attracted towards that positive charge. So this molecule here is going to be this molecule here is going to be attracted to this molecule because of this slight positive charge. Um, and in particular, the electrons are going to be, because they are negative, the electrons are going to be attracted in this sort of direction. And actually, if we do that, we can see that the protons and the rest of the atoms, uh, nuclei of the atoms in this molecule are staying more or less where they are. The electrons are kind of shifting to this side. We end up with a slight negative charge on this side because of these electrons moving towards the slight positive charge. And then we end up with a slight positive charge on this side. Now, this was an instantaneous dipole because it formed on its own. This one here has been induced by the other molecule. And so we have an instantaneous dipole forming which induces a dipole in another molecule, and then we end up with this plus and minus electrostatic attraction between these two molecules. And that's what we call London force. There is an attraction between these two molecules caused by instantaneous and induced dipoles, um, which holds them uh, together to a certain extent. So the last thing to say about these is that they are only temporary. This instantaneous dipole, caused by the random movement of the electrons, may end. And then we lose the charges, and then the dipoles which have been induced by that original one will um, also um, cease to be. And so they are temporary, but they are constantly happening at random positions on the molecule. Let's look at a couple of other molecules. Here's butane two molecules of butane there. And I've also got two molecules of hexane. So let's compare um, the London forces between these two things. Right, if we've got a larger molecule, then first of all, you'll notice that because it's got more atoms in its formula, there are more electrons. Number of electrons is really important. It's, it's basically king. Um, but once we, if we have things with the same amount of electrons, there are other factors which are important. But the most important thing for um, molecules determining the, the amount of London force is, is, the, is the number of electrons. Okay. Um, the second important thing is that if I if I have a longer molecule, yes, okay, I have plenty of um, places here that I could form my instantaneous dipole. Uh, which could cause an attraction there. But along this molecule, actually, because it's longer, there are more places where the instantaneous dipole could actually start. 
um, and um, there are when they are together there are more places where an, a dipole could be induced um, and we say that that is because they have a greater surface area of contact there is more surface area of the molecule for these dipoles uh, instantaneous and induced dipoles to act on that being the case we have more chance of instantaneous dipoles forming more induced dipoles forming as a result of the instantaneous ones there'll be a greater attraction between two larger molecules than there will be between two smaller molecules. So if we measure the boiling point of these two, so we find that because there are fewer electrons in this one, uh, then we will have, and we have a smaller surface area of contact, we will find that there are fewer instantaneous dipoles, fewer induced dipoles, and because of that, the attraction will be less between these two. We find the boiling point of that is minus one degree C. Okay, butane uh, has a relatively low boiling point. If we look at hexane, because we have more electrons, greater surface area of contact, more instantaneous dipoles producing more induced dipoles, giving an overall a greater attraction, we find that this actually boils at 68 degrees C. Okay, so this one is liquid at room temperature, this one is a gas. The second thing we can look at is the degree of branching, and here you'll notice I've got isomers of hexane. We've got hexane, we've got 2-methyl um, pentane, and we've got 2,2-dimethyl butane. Um, and they all have the same relative mass, they will all have the same number of electrons. So in this situation, actually the only thing affecting um, the boiling point is going to be the, for the intermolecular forces between the same number of electrons. So it's actually the surface area of contact is much more important when we're talking about this. So if we have more branching we will have less surface area of contact and so therefore we will form fewer instantaneous dipoles between the molecules which will induce fewer dipoles in other molecules which will lead to a weaker attraction and if the attraction is weaker we'll end up with a lower melting and boiling point so we said hexane was um, 68 degrees C is its boiling point. If we look at 2-methyl uh, uh, pentane, we find that, that is 61 degrees C is its boiling point because of this uh, lower surface area of contact, fewer instantaneous dipoles, fewer induced dipoles, weaker attraction, lower boiling point. And, and here, with 2,2-dimethyl butane, we have even less surface area of contact, fewer instantaneous dipoles, fewer induced dipoles as a result, weaker attraction. Because of the weaker attraction, we find that we have a boiling point of 49 degrees C. Another important thing is that when we're looking here at boiling points which are higher, what we really talk about with a higher boiling point is we're looking at a measure of there being energy needed to separate the molecules. So more energy is needed to separate this molecule than those molecules because of those forces of attraction being weaker or stronger. If we think about the previous example with chain length as well, again, the boiling point is a measure of the energy needed to separate the molecules. So more energy and less energy used to separate molecules.